every creature in nature lives according to what is designed to be every animal every tree uh, of a particular kind when it multiplies when it reproduces will produce the same kind and it sticks for example a dog will have a dog's nature even after generations and generations it still behaves as to what is supposed to be except for the humans interestingly enough human beings have to change their nature to regain their original self human beings have to change their nature to regain what god designed them to be in the first place it's a very strange thing we are the only thing in all creation that have to step out of the way why it's all because of one key word that entered mankind called sin god created man in his own image but when sin entered mankind the image that god made and god designed was marred and destroyed by this one word called sin but thanks be to the lord jesus christ this is what christianity is all about jesus christ came according to the scriptures he lived according to the scriptures he died according to the scriptures he was buried according to the scriptures but he rose from the grave according to the scriptures and he took care of the problem of sin so if we put our faith in jesus christ bible says we will be saved and our original nature that god intended for us in the first place will be restored 100% so that's a simple principle that we need to understand and the whole bible that we hold in our hands the whole scriptures talk about this one man jesus christ and his act of redemption what jesus has done is there from genesis to revelation all throughout the scripture sometimes it's hidden sometimes it's very obvious sometimes it's prophetic sometimes it it has a um, it has remarkable implications all throughout the scripture it all points to one man christ says all scriptures are written about me and one thing we are looking at uh, according to the scriptures is this one strange kind of structure that god gave the israelites when they were on their journey from egypt to the promised land and that's what is called a tabernacle we are looking at this tabernacle we are in the part 9 of this series and it's a strange kind of structure god said build me a place so that i can dwell, come and dwell amidst you everything every component in the tabernacle points to the lord jesus christ every little aspect we saw the the schematics or the other blueprints or the layouts of this tabernacle the special purpose of what tabernacle is designed for is the restoration of fellowship with god himself as i said before sin destroyed the fellowship of man with god and the only way that man can be reconciled and restored into god's relationship is to deal with the problem of sin and that's what a tabernacle up is a picture of and in this uh, 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 furniture that we see in the tabernacle or every component it's how god restores the relationship the way to god from god's holy of holies for man from the outside of the tabernacle how that relationship is restored is what we see uh, through this entire picture so far we we covered about the linen fence which uh, talks about the righteousness of god how god is holy how we are not and how we got to uh, in order to achieve that intimacy we got to pass through the gate we talked about that we talked about the enclosure the main structure itself we also talked about the altar of sacrifice which represents christ on the cross it's a place where the lambs were sacrificed for the sins of man and that's a representation of cross itself we talked about it and we talked about the laver where there's a washing the priest had to wash his hands before he entered into the main sanctuary and laver talks about the scripture we need to have the washing of the word in order to have fellowship with god that was the lesson that we learned we also went into the holy place that the next immediate room that exists next to the laver is called the holy place and we looked at a couple of components there we took at the table of showbread which represents the word of god and we also looked at the altar of incense which represents the prayer of the saints and today we're going to zoom in further and we're going to look at uh, the holy place in which this one component called the golden candlestick that's what king james version calls it 
It's also known as the menorah, according to the Hebrew language, or it's also known as the lampstand. So we are going to look at this. We are going to look at this structure. So table of showbread is on the immediate right when you enter the holy place, and right before you, when you walk into the holy place, is this altar of incense. But on the left side is this lampstand, and this is what we'll be talking about. The lampstand or the menorah is one of the most ornate structures in the tabernacles. Very beautiful structure that exists. It's made up of pure gold, and it is a symbol. For the Jewish people from ancient times, for over the history of hundreds of years, even now, even today, it's a symbol for the Jewish people, the people of Israel. So, if we look into、uh, the details of this, let's see what God told Moses regarding the construction of this uh, uh, of this menorah, of the lampstand. He, God says in Exodus twenty-five thirty-one thirty-two, "Make a lampstand of pure gold and hammer it out of the base and the shaft." Its、uh, flower-like cups and the buds and the blossoms、uh, shall be of one piece with it. Six branches are to be extended from the sides of the lamp, three on one side, three on the other. He gives further details and he says, "Then make its seven lamps and set them up on it, so that there are light in the space in front of it. Its wick trimmers and the trays are to be of pure gold. A talent of pure gold is to be used for the lampstand and all these accessories." See that you make them according to the pattern、uh, shown to you on the mountain. So God was very specific in in giving the details. The interesting thing is they used this kind of、uh, menorah, which is made up of solid gold, and it's close to 90 pounds. 90 pounds of pure gold. This is the lampstand that is uh, uh, already built for the third temple, where the Jewish people are ready, getting ready to build. It's made up of solid gold. But listen to this. God said, "When you make this menorah, this lampstand, it has to be made of one piece and needs to be hammered out. It's not meant to be cast. It's not meant to be molded into shape. But they have to take this one solid piece of gold and shape it into this structure." If I was thinking in a North American way, I would say, "Lord, you're wasting the resources." And wasting the time too. Why don't you just get the mold made and we can set it up? But God was very specific and He said, "See to it that you make them according to the pattern I have shown you on the mountain." God was very specific in the details. He said, "It has to be hammered from one piece. It, it's not meant to be joined. It's not meant to be molded." At the very first time when I came to University of Texas in Dallas. The one thing that fascinated me、uh, about Americans is I was walking to my class, to my department in biotechnology in University of Texas. I was on my way to my classroom. There was this maintenance guy on campus, and he was driving a nice little small cart. You know the maintenance guys how they drive these little trucks around. I always wanted to drive one of those. But I just stood there and watched him do what he does. So he was driving. That's the very first time I've seen that little cart. He drove around. He had a little sack on the side, and next thing he pulled out was a long stick, which had a claw at the bottom. And what he did next thing is it was fall. The leaves were on the floor. He just used the stick and he picked up the leaves with that stick. And I said, "Wait a minute! They have a tool for everything here. In order to pick up leaves, they have a tool." And I was so surprised. I stood there and just staring at it. It's like what a marvelous invention. So every time, even today, if I do something and it feels a little harder, I think there must be some tool for this, right? There must be something that somebody already designed. You know how easy we make it in our life. How easy we have these components ready, and how easy our lifestyle is here. My dad in India, when I was growing up, he said, "Bend your back." Then you will grow up. If you learn how to bend your back, you will grow up. And when I come to North America, you don't have to bend your back, and you'll still grow up. That's a strange thing. So my dad told a lie back in India. You don't have to work hard here. You got a tool for everything, right? So when God gave an instruction for a lampstand, He didn't expect it to to be an easy way for the craftsmen. He said, "Make it from one piece." It's a lot of work. But it had to be done in God's method anyway. Why did I tell you about the leaf picking habit and of that maintenance guy? The reason why the same principles are now seen in the church. We try to simplify and try to help God 
with uh, uh, some ability, with some lights, with some smoke, with some technology to such an extent that uh, technology replaces God. And we think that we have a tool for everything and we can create God's presence with the things that we do with uh, uh, trying to please people. My friends, we cannot help God. We got to do God things, God's things, God's way, and then only they will prosper. There is no simple way of being a disciple for Christ. Christ said not to be a disciple. We got to deny ourselves, take up the cross and follow him. There's no easy way. It's after you become a born again believer, it's not a ride in the clouds to go to heaven. He got to work hard and be a disciple in studying the word in prayer and every other area. And then only we can be shaped into God's likeness. Then only we can be conformed into God's image. So menorah is a good example of how a believer should walk. So if you look at this structure, it has this main shaft, a central uh, axis, uh, if I may use that word. And it's, uh, it is, uh, it's very strong. It has a base and it has three branches on either side. And it's uh, uh, not according to this picture, but apparently the central branch or the central shaft of the seven is a little higher than the rest of the branches. So on top of this lampstand are lamps, are uh, golden lamps that are placed on top. And in this, they poured oil. They used olive oil and they had uh, wicks at the end of them. And the priest had to light these wicks and then there was light in the holy place. There was uh, also a tongs that are made of pure gold that God said they need to have because probably they're used for trimming the wicks and to dress the lamps and stuff probably. And the only source of light within the tabernacle, interestingly enough, is this lampstand. There's no windows in the tabernacle and the lamp is the only source of light uh, and it has to be kept burning according to the scriptures all throughout the night. So what is the typology or what does this lampstand represent? Number one, it represents Christ Jesus himself. And I said this lampstand is made up of pure gold. And when we looked at the furniture, different aspects of the furniture in the tabernacle, most of them when we read it was acacia wood overlaid with gold. But the lampstand is the only piece which is made up of absolute gold. And when there's wood and gold, it represent, represents, wood represents the humanity of Christ, gold represents the deity of Christ. But in this case, the lampstand is absolutely represents the glory of Christ Jesus, the kingliness of the deity of Christ and nothing else. And as I said before, Christ is the only source of light in, to, in order to have fellowship. In order to have fellowship, we need Christ and Christ alone and through him, we can have this intimacy with God, and that's what this uh, lampstand represents. But lampstand also represents the Holy Spirit. The light that emanates from the lampstand illuminates everything around it. The lampstand itself is Christ, but the Holy Spirit's work is to reflect or bring forth who Christ is. When Christ came, he said, I came, and uh, when you see me, you see my Father. Christ came to show the Father's nature. But when the Holy Spirit came, he came to represent and show who Christ is. So there is like a, 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 a tag race here, a tag uh, kind of process that happens. And Holy Spirit's work, when he illumines, he illumines us about who Christ is and his deity. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. When Christ was going, he said this, but the counselor of the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you the things and will remind you of the things I have said to you. The Holy Spirit will remind you the things of what Christ said, and that's what his job is. And one of the most interesting things, inside the tabernacle, you see this extraordinary beauty. But outside, if you look at it, it is a, just a matter of skins that cover the entire tabernacle. So in order to have an understanding of who God is, if you look at God, if you look at what Christ has done through a worldly perspective, we will not have a clear idea. If you look at it, all you can see is the skin and some structure right there, but you will not be excited looking at it. But only when you enter inside, you'll see the glory of God. So when unbelievers, a people who, were not, who are not born again, try to explain God according to the natural light, that's the light outside 
the tabernacle, when they try to explain him with human reasoning and philosophies, it'll, it'll absolutely uh, doesn't make sense. It'll not make sense and it'll sound like foolishness because it has no value because all they can see is foolishness. But only when you go inside, you will see the beauty of Christ. First Corinthians talks about it. In the chapter 2, verse 14. For the man without the spirit does not accept the things that come from the spirit of God. They're foolishness to them, and he cannot understand them because they're spiritually uh, discerned. They cannot, uh, be, uh, they cannot understand because they're spiritually discerned. So you cannot understand the things of God without the help of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is a key person in the Trinity that will help us understand the mysteries of God. So when you enter the inside, when you see the beauty of the holy place, when you see the gold, when you see the light, when you see the bread and the incense going, you'll experience the marvelous intimacy and fellowship with God. And then you'll say what Paul said in Philippians chapter 3 verse 10. He says, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being conformable unto his death. So when you go in, when you experience this marvelous presence of God, your heart will be craving with the desire to know this intimacy with God. And that's the beauty of what uh, the Holy Spirit does. So as we move further, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. In John chapter 9, verse 5, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. So Christ represents the lampstand. He says, I am the light. He doesn't have the light, but he is an embodiment of light itself. He is the light of the world. He also says in 1 John 1, 5 to 7, God is light. In him there is no darkness. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and we do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, of, uh, blood of Jesus' son purifies us from all sin. My friends, here we are, we move from the altar of sacrifice, we wash with the, at the labor, we enter into the presence of the holy place, and here we are, the light is shining in our lives. It's so bright that nothing can be hidden from God's sight. So when we live in the light as Christians, when we walk according to what the Bible says, when we live a righteous life, living with Christ constantly, His light will show the hidden areas of our life. His life his light will show the sin in our life. And once you see the sin, you cannot keep quiet. Say, for example, if you see a dusty room and you don't know whether it, there is dust or not when it's all dark, but as soon as you turn on the light or open the blinds, you can see the dust flying in the air. You see the dust on the table. You dust, see dust on everything. And uh, if you have some compulsive obsessive disorder sometimes, sometimes I do, right? You'd want to make sure that there's no speck of dust. When I, tr I try to clean my computer screen, I try to clean it as clean as, po uh, clean as possible with the, the air can, with all this smudge removal cloths or whatever, but still something remains. And I might be working on the computer, but that little speck will be nagging me so hard that I got to take care of that. So I still try to smudge it, but I only make it bigger. So what happens every time you try to make, clean it up, it only gets bigger. Why? Because you're aware of something that is there on the screen and it just bothers you until you take care of it. That's the same that happens with Christians. When we walk with the Lord, when we live a righteous life, when we have fellowship with God, when we live in this light, the darkness cannot stay in our life. Everything we do something wrong. Every time, every time we do something wrong, every time we do something sinful, the light will be a torment. Unless we deal with that sin right away, we will not have the peace of God. I don't know about you, but when I fall in sin, when I fail in a little thing, when I, when I become mean, when I say something harsh, it torments me until I say, Lord, I'm sorry. Until I say something, I got to confess my sin right away. Otherwise, it will really bother me. So when we live in fellowship with God, we cannot, we cannot uh, not confess our sin. A double negative there. So because the light will show, uh, the light, Jesus who is the light himself will show our hidden areas, our sin in our lives, and we have to confess. Not only that, this light shines on the table of showbread. 
which talks about the word of God, and that's where we have communion with him. It also talks about the incense, that's where we have our prayer times. So not only that, we see the holy of holies and how the curtain separates the God's uh, absolute presence from man, and it also reveals God's righteous standards. So light that emanates from this lampstand keeps us accountable, and that light is Christ himself. There's something interesting. This light of Christ Jesus is seen as a sevenfold spirit. Let me explain this a little better. The lampstand represents Christ, but it also represents the Holy Spirit. There's a sevenfold spirit that came upon Christ when he came onto this earth and when he did ministry. I'm not talking about seven Holy Spirits. Mind you, don't mistake me here. A sevenfold ministry is a sevenfold aspect of the Holy Spirit that came upon Christ, and this was prophesied. Let me give you this evidence. Based on Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1 and 2, the shoot will come from the stump of Jesse, from the roots as a branch that will bear fruit. The Spirit of the Lord, this talking about Christ, 400, 500 years ago before he actually came to this earth. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom, of understanding, of counsel, spirit of counsel, and of power, the spirit of knowledge, and of the fear of the Lord. So if you look at this picture, when Christ came onto this planet, and when he was baptized by John, Bible says, the spirit came upon him like a dove. The spirit came and rested on him. And if you portray this in the lampstand, the main axis represents Christ. The spirit came and rested, but it came sevenfold. We saw wisdom and understanding, we saw uh, counsel and power, and we also saw knowledge and fear that rested upon Christ Jesus during his ministry. It's a sevenfold aspect to the person of Jesus Christ when he was living in this planet. But here is a strange thing. In order for us to be transformed into the image of Christ, this sequence is also seen in the lampstand itself. So as a new Christian, the first thing that happens, the Holy Spirit will lead us into two things knowledge and fear. The very first time you become a Christian, the very first time uh, you, uh, you and I uh, get saved and experience uh, the salvation through the work of the Holy Spirit again, the first thing that uh, 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 is cultivated in our heart is the desire for the knowledge of who actually Christ is. So we have this knowledge, the knowledge, we begin to devour the word, devour the scriptures, trying to understand who he is. But also, the more we try to understand the magnitude of God's greatness, there is a fear that is in our hearts. I'm not talking about the fear, fear that the world produces. The fear here, that's nice, fear here is the reverence of God. The reverence and the holiness and the magnitude uh, of who God's being is, is revealed in our early stages of life. And from there, we move on to another aspect, the knowledge that the Holy Spirit gives. It becomes the counsel in our lives. If we, if we go through tough times, if you're going through struggles in our life, your counsel and my counsel primary, primarily comes from the Holy Spirit because one of the titles of the Holy Spirit is Comforter and Counselor. The Lord is going to minister to us. He's, the Holy Spirit is going to make that knowledge a counsel in our lives. And not only that, he will give us the power to overcome, overcome circumstances. The Bible says in James, God didn't give us a spirit of fear. He didn't give us a spirit of timidity, but he gave us a spirit of power. So the Holy Spirit is power, dynamos. That's what the Bible talks about. So if we move from knowledge and fear, we move into the counsel and the power, and the greatest and the deepest way that things happen, we move on to the wisdom and understanding. Wisdom is knowledge applied. Just because we have the head knowledge doesn't make us obedient to the scriptures. Wisdom is when we apply this knowledge into our lives, that's where it comes, actually works. The knowledge transcends from head to the heart. That's where wisdom is. And the understanding, the word understanding means standing under. We are standing under the promises of God because we have a better understanding. We have this longing for the depths and the mysteries of what God has revealed to us. And that's one of the other aspects of what this lampstand is. And when we pass through all this sequence, we finally are conformed into the image of Christ. We'll be in, uh, moving into perfection. But this is not a life, uh, this is not a one-time thing that happens. It's a lifetime process to become like Christ. And we can never achieve that stage as long as we are in the flesh because 
perfection hasn't come yet. We are still imperfect. But this is the process of a believer that you can see the sequence in the, in the lampstand itself. So when I uh, cracked this code this week, I was so excited. I said, Lord, thank you for revealing this truth. Because I was wondering, Lord, how, what is the path of maturity? How can you grow? What does this lampstand reflect? And all of a sudden, when you have an understanding like this, it's like a dynamite going off in your heart. You can't wait to tell to people. I can't wait for Sunday morning to share this. You know, because, because this is the truth that excites me. This is the beauty of the lampstand. Not only this lampstand signifies this maturity, but I told you before, it also sheds light on the table of showbread, which is the word of God, and altar of incense, which is the prayer. So the, another lesson here is the way we can become mature Christians is by dwelling on the word, feeding on the word with the assistance of the Holy Spirit, praying in accordance to the Holy Spirit, and then we can grow into the maturity. See how everything is tied up? What a marvelous picture. As we move on, I said lampstand also represents the Holy Spirit. Jesus said he's the light of the world. But after he died, buried, and he resurrected, he went to be with his father. So what happened? The light of the world is with the Father. But don't worry about it. If Christ is gone, he said, I'm going to send you a spirit, my helper, the spirit. So I pray to the Father, he'll give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. God gave us the Holy Spirit to abide with us. And the Holy Spirit's responsibility is to illuminate us in the knowledge of Christ, as I said before. This is what God said. Exodus 27, 20. Then you shall uh, command the children of Israel that they bring you pure oil pressed of olives for the light to cause the lamp to burn continually. I'll show you a marvelous picture right here. The oil for this lampstand had to be co uh, coming from the olives. They had to crush the olives to produce the light. When Christ in his lifetime when he lived and people rejected him and um, he did all his ministry for three and a half years, the last night before he was betrayed, he was praying in a garden where his spirit was crushed. And you know the garden's name? Gethsemane. You know what Gethsemane means? Olive press. That's where olives are crushed. So here is Christ in the garden of Gethsemane, his spirit being crushed so that he, through his death, can, will be able to send the Holy Spirit. See the marvelous picture there? From the lampstand, lamp you see the tremendous sequence of this oil comes from the olives itself. And uh, Christ also says, this oil represents the Holy Spirit. As we move on, Romans 8, 9 says, but you, however, are not controlled by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit, the Spirit of God that lives in you. If anybody does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not uh, belong to Christ. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and Christ, sometimes the, they, are in, they are inseparable, and sometimes the words are used interchangeably. So God says, you know, this Spirit will lead us into all truth, and if we don't have the Holy Spirit, we, are not, uh, we do not belong to Christ. That's what the Bible is saying. So John 16, 13, and 15, talking about the Holy Spirit again, what His ministry is. But when He comes, the Spirit of the truth, He'll come and He'll guide you into all truth. He will sp not speak on his own. He'll speak only what he hears. He'll tell you what is yet to come. He'll bring you the glory to me by taking from what is mine, making it known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will take from what is mine and make it known to you. So here is the picture. The lampstand represents Christ. And the wicks of the lampstand represent the believers that is you and me. And the oil on the, in the lampstand represents the Holy Spirit. Here is a simple pattern. In order for us to bear witness to Christ, in order to be a testimony and light to this world, we need the Holy Spirit power. The Holy Spirit is the oil that ignites and brings the message of the cross and bears witness to what Christ has done. And then as he flows through your life and my life, we'll be light unto the world and we can shine in this world. So here is, you understood the sequence? Christ is the lampstand, the Holy Spirit is the oil, and the wicks are the believers. And in order to be a testimony unto God, we need this connection 
without this connection, without Christ, without the Holy Spirit, and uh, without us not being available, we cannot be a testimony unto God. And through our lives, God will glorify himself. Here is this marvelous ornamental structure in the tabernacle. And the light is so attractive. And Holy Spirit's ministry is very attractive. As the cross is a reproach, but Holy Spirit's ministry is very attractive. See, we, once we are saved, the altar and the labor on the outside, we can see, yes, we come to the Lord. We don't know what to expect. We don't know what fellowship is involved. So when we become a born-again believer, the next thing is you try to understand who God is, try to get deeper in that sequence of the lampstand that we just saw. And the more we try to understand God, the more deeper we go in the scriptures, the more we understand the, the magnificence and the light that there is in God. So our life doesn't end at salvation. We need to grow in fellowship. The Holy Spirit does it in two major ways. Number one, he assigns, directs, and empowers the gifts in the body of Christ. There's manifestation gifts, redemptive gifts, and, and the different uh, offices of the church. The Holy Spirit empowers the bodies of believers of Christ to experience his glory to be used as light in this world. The second thing he does is leading us into the fullness of Christ or the maturity. It's dependent upon the first point again. The gifts are given to edify the body of Christ. And once we have the gifts of the Holy Spirit in our life, we move on into maturity. Here is the thing, my friends. One day, somebody wanted to give a prophecy on me in India. They came to me and said, God is going to bless you. They wanted, I knew they were a little fake. They said, God is going to bless you. I said, tell me something that I do not know. I know that my God is going to bless me. That's what the Bible says. My friends, when the Spirit ministers, He edifies the body of Christ. If someone comes to you and gives you a prophecy that you're going to find your keys, how is that going to edify the body of Christ? That's my question. Anything God does, it's for His reasons, not for our selfish reasons. If God is not going to prophesy and tell me that I'm going to win a lottery ticket, why, how is that going to be edify, edifying to the body of Christ? So everything that he does, everything that the Holy Spirit does, will not be contrary to the scriptures. He'll do exactly what the Bible says. It's Bible-based, and that's his ministry. And through the edification of this body, through this empowering of the Holy Spirit, we move on into the likeness of Christ. All our life's goal is to become like Christ, to be a glory to God, to be a, a, a God's vessel of honor. That's what our ultimate pursuit in life is. It's not for our selfish ambitions to make our life's life better when we exist on this planet. That's not God's uh, dream and uh, dream and plans for you. His plans are you to, for you to prosper in the spirit to be conformed into the likeness of the Son. That's pretty much it. So anytime you think about the spirits and giftings that the Bible talks about the, over the Holy Spirit, every time look at it that it is meant for the edification of the body of Christ and nothing else. If God gives you things for a reason so that you can be a blessing and to others so that you can grow yourself into the likeness of Christ. So here we are just uh, uh, wrapping up the few things here. Seven, seven symbolic meanings. Lampstand beaten from pure gold. One piece, the beating of the lampstand from gold signifies the sufferings of Christ and out, out of which this beautiful ornamental structure called the menorah came about. Christ suffered resulted in his glory. Then we, we also saw a lampstand is located inside the holy place. The world cannot see the beauty of Christ, but as a believer, when you walk into the holy place, you can see the beauty of Christ. Lamp, lampstand has seven bowls filled with oil. It sim symbolizes that the Holy Spirit is all sufficient for a believer in this day to live a holy life. The Holy Spirit is the key person that is responsible for the beautification of the bride, and we need to understand that. Lampstand is also given at a significant period of, time, period of time in the nation of Israel's history. They're walking through the wilderness. It's dark. They haven't reached their promised land yet. But the lampstand was given to give a hope that yes, the future is coming. And Christ was the light when he was living in this world. And he is the light for us right now. And he will watch us and instruct us and teach us the way we should go in this dark world until we uh, one day be with him face to face and be, dwell with 
him forever. So the lampstand is given during the dark times, just like Christ is given to us, the Holy Spirit is given to us during these dark times. Lampstand has seven branches. We talked about the sequence of maturity for a believer. Lampstand is related to this table of showbread. I told you on the north, on the south side, I think it's south. Don't quote me on that, south or north, it's somewhere. Okay, on the south is the table of showbread, and the lamp sheds the light on the table of showbread, and that's where we need to feed on the word of God based on the power of the Holy Spirit. Lampstand is also related to the altar of incense. I'm coming to the final part. God gave specific instructions about the ornamentation upon this lampstand. He said you need to have a, make a lampstand of pure gold, hammer it out, uh, um, uh, uh, hammer it out, base and shaft, and its flower like cups, uh, buds, blossoms shall be of one piece. There are a few things that are there on this uh, lampstand. There are little cups that are uh, attached to it or that are there as a part of it. There are little buds and also there are flowers on the top. What are these things significant for? The cups signify death. The cup signifies death and it's related to the, uh, to the altar of incense when you pour yourself to die in God's presence. There are four cups on the main shaft and three on the six branches. The three cups on the branches signify three kinds of death. There's death, to, uh, death in this world, death to sin, and death to self. That's what he's talking about. Death to the world. We have been crucified with Christ. We are dead to this world. The next thing is the death to sin, the freedom from the bondage of Satan, the death to our desires, to what the devil tries to do. And the third one is the death to self, being poured out as an offering. As we grow in intimacy with God, we die to ourselves, my friends. Paul says, I'm, I'm crucified with Christ. Paul says, I die daily. He's not talking about the hair die. He's saying, I'm die, I die daily. And we need to die daily to our desires, our fan- fantasies, our longings. And we got to have the desire to live for God. And the next stage you see are the buds. Unless you die, we cannot bear the fruit. And the buds signify the fruit. And the buds are symbolic of the table of showbread as well. So here we are, we move from death, we move into these buds which are also look like knobs. There are, uh, there, there are uh, this one knob on each of the six branches and the four knobs on the main shaft. And we, it represents that we need to die for ourselves but also move on to become the fruit for God and we need to feed on his word. The next thing we see are these flowers. There are four flowers on the main shaft and there's one single flower on the rest of the branches. The flower signifies the blossom. It, it signifies that here we are through our death. By bearing fruit, we become like Christ. The ultimate thing is to become like Christ into his image, to blossom and to become the pretty and the beautiful bride that God ordained us to the first place. So here is a, a true Christian life. From the cup, from the, from the death, we pass on uh, to bear fruit and then we become the blossoms for the Lord itself. And all this happens because of what the Holy Spirit does. Do not remove Holy Spirit out of the equation. And finally, my friends, the priests, when they enter the holy place, nobody watches them. They are in seclusion of the table of showbread, the altar of incense and the lampstand. It's not a showmanship. There's no performance involved. The absolute fellowship comes from this intimacy between you and God. There is no corporate intimacy with God. Yes, we can be united as believers, but we are accountable to our own lives as to how we have fellowship with God. Let me explain in simple terms. When you read your Bible and when you pray, it's what you do is you are accountable for. You, cannot, you can do it as a group, but personally, how do you long for the things of God? How much do you depend upon the light from the lampstand? It's up to you. You'll be keeping uh, tabs. You'll be growing yourself. If I eat my meal, you won't be satisfied. You got to eat your own. That's a simple principle. So when you enter into God's presence, when you want this absolute devotion, you need to separate yourself from the world. Some Christians try to be showmen. They like to show off their faith, 
I've seen some people where they're so flamboyant in their display. I'm like, man, when the guy sings like crazy and, and he jumps around in some worship situations, I think this guy is an absolute sellout for God. He's sold out for God. And the next thing, probably he'll be watching a hockey game or something. It's like, take him, beat him up, you know? And probably he has a different kind of language outside the church. Probably he's different within the church and he's different outside. Your expressions in flesh do not signify how much you love the Lord. Mind you, it's your heart and the intimacy. Bible says deep calls to deep. When you have that intimacy with God, then only, only God can determine how much you love God. If you see some people lifting up their hands at seaside, it's okay. Don't judge them based on that. At the same time, if they don't lift up their hands to worship God, don't judge them based on that as well. But else at the same time, the spirit, when it expresses itself in flesh, it'll manifest in joy. You'll sing with joy. You'll clap your hands. When you see something good, who told people to clap their hands? You see, for example, if you see something spectacular, you don't say, okay, I see something spectacular. Probably these two things need to come together now. You don't do that, do you? You know, it's a spontaneous reaction. Even for a tribal man, if he sees something exciting, he just claps his hands. I used to work with a guy named Isaac in my Bible school. He's, he's from Africa. Very nice guy. He always calls me brother, brother. Always says brother, brother. He's a very good, very happy man. But whenever I used to share a joke with him, the next thing he did was, we used to paint together in the Bible school. He used to drop the painting brush and start jumping there. And he used to jump with joy because I shared a joke. And he used to laugh and clap his hands. I said, man, this guy knows how to rejoice. You know, I need to learn from him. You know, this guy knows how to get excited for the things that he just heard. And I said, man, Africa would be my dream nation to learn how to celebrate. If you've seen those people do, if you see Africans do a protest, you know what they do? They say, we hate you, we hate. You know, they do it in such a beautiful way. There, there's songs, there's melody, there's harmony. Somebody picks up a harmony for we hate you. You know, there's a beautiful singing that goes on. Everything looks wonderful because whatever they do, they do it with all their hearts. From their spirit, it's manifested in the flesh. And my friends, that's what God expects. When we have this absolute devotion, it's okay to rejoice, okay to celebrate, and it's okay to smile. Christians smile sometimes. Because after you become a Christian, we think that we are the most holy people. We lose that smile. And the world looks at us as, what, can, what happened to this guy? Is he holy saint that nobody can approach him anymore? Rejoice. When I was in, the bio, in, in my university in India, I used to take my guitar to these dorms and play some songs and sing God's praises. And they say, what makes you so happy, my friend? My friends used to ask me, these non-Christian Hindus. It's like, you know what? I'll tell you, but come tomorrow. I'll tell you what happened. So next day they're waiting in the library uh, under the tree and we're sitting there. Said, Jesus happened to me. He changed my life. I'm so happy now. It's like, yeah, that's great, bro. We need that joy too. We are the Christians. We are the people of light. We need that absolute devotion which will manifest for the world. And the main devotion comes from the presence of the Lord. When we are separated from God, there's no time for the worldly lusts. No time for the desire for the things of the world. But my friends, here is one of the major points that I'll, that I'll share and then I'll close. Many churches have severed the lifeline for their existence. You know what the lifeline for the church is? It's Holy Spirit. The moment we break ties with the Holy Spirit, our lifeline is broken. There's no need to exist anymore. We exist like an organization or an institution. When Baptists think about Pentecostals or Charismatics, all they think is the Holy Spirit people and they're all wacky and we think about all that stuff. But when you look at some Baptists, they're good as dead because they cut off every tie with the Holy Spirit. You cannot sever the line with the Holy Spirit because He is the reason why we are the light of the world. He is the reason why we emanate what we emanate. Do not judge people based on the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit. Seaside community needs the Holy Spirit and He is the one who is responsible. It's not it. He, Holy Spirit, He is the one who makes us blossom, who makes us uh, shine, makes us grow into maturity. He is the one that leads us into all triumph. Here is the final thing. The only way we can achieve 
this communion with the Lord. The only way we can achieve this fellowship is with the Holy Spirit. But mind you, Holy Spirit will never do anything contrary to the Word of God. He always leads us through the scriptures and he only augments Christ and Christ alone. Christ came, the Holy Spirit came to reflect Christ. Christ came to reflect the Father. Until we become like Christ, the Holy Spirit is at work in our lives. Communion comes from the table of showbread. Word of God, prayer, fellowship, three things. That's what seaside should be built on. That's what our life should be built on. And then we are pleasing our Lord. May we be a light in this world. May we be the true Christian.